turns, without clubs, without hassles, everybody pulls together and everybody helps each other. And it works. It's been working since we got here. And that's going to continue working. No matter what happens when they go back to the city, this thing is happening. And in person, it can happen. It looks like it's just, that's what it's all about, you know? Hi, and welcome to a Small Medium at Large podcast. I'm your host, Gail Heisen, bringing you intimate stories that heal. I want to thank all you listeners for subscribing, liking, taking the time to write really thoughtful comments, and for sharing our show with your friends and family. Today, August 17th, the 53rd year anniversary of the amazing concert of Woodstock, We have a special guest today with us that we're really happy to be sharing with our our podcast today. We will be having Dan Buxpin and Karen Matsu Greenberg, but first let me tell you something about them. Daniel Buxpin is a writer with over 25 years experience. He has written for such publications as Fortune, CNBC, Condé Nast Traveler, and The Daily Beast. Dan Buxman is also the author of The Encyclopedia of Heavy Metal, The Encyclopedia of New Wave, The Essential Wit of the World's Funniest People, and his most recent book, Woodstock, 50 Years of Peace and Music, released in June 2019 on the 50 year anniversary. Currently, he's completing a book that will be released in 2023, Ozzy at 75. Karen, the producer of the 50 Years of Woodstock book, Karen Matsu Greenberg, the producer of Woodstock's 50 Years Peace and Music, has produced and printed thousands of books of every format and category while working in the publishing industry. But as a publisher and producer, this title, she said, was the most satisfying one she did. After growing up in the 60s on Long Island, Karen moved to Berkeley, California, where she began a career in the publishing industry that spanned over 30 years. She was involved in Barnes and Noble's New York City home office, upgrading databases and barcodes on thousands of title book series to ensure customer satisfaction. Now she raises chickens with her husband, Phil, near the Delaware River in upstate New York and runs a gluten-free bakery that serves delicious foods to farmers markets in Sullivan County, utilizing farm eggs and locally raised produce. So let's welcome Dan and Karen to our show today. Hi so, guys. It is so lovely Hi. to see you guys again and to have this moment after the two years of suffering that we just went through. <laughs> it's so nice to catch up with you guys and see your faces again. It's really wonderful to see your faces. and. I, I have to share with the audience, especially audience that doesn't know this, but the reason that I have Dan and Karen here is because I was interviewed for their book, Woodstock, 50 Years of Peace and Music. And that actually ended up not being just an interview, but the starting of what we call a beautiful friendship. So I feel like my guests are actually also my new friends and they come in the same heartfelt, opening, loving experience like the Woodstock experience was. So I just want to thank you for giving me that opportunity to be with you guys and uh, for us to be together today and share with everyone about what happened 53 years ago that you got to investigate as uh, an author. So uh, I was wondering if we wanted to start with a little bit of what it was like before on what it was for you to put together just the idea of your book, which is about more about the attendees than say the rock stars. And this was a very new path in writing a book about that event. And I was wondering if you could share what it was like to just, and how you and Karen came up with this. I don't know if you planned this together or how this happened. Well, um, Karen, we got, we had worked on some, she actually was uh, worked on my heavy metal book. Uh, so we, kind of have some past already. Uh, And she also was friends with my father-in-law who is no longer with us, unfortunately. Uh, But, you know, as someone I knew already. And so that meant that, you know, a lot of that time that you have to spend getting to know someone and understanding that process. And that was not, we didn't have to go through that. We could kind of just, you know, be off to the races. And she told me that she was talking to 
this one publisher, Charles Bridge, who wanted to do a book about Woodstock for the 50th anniversary. And for a music writer, like, I don't even have to think about that. It's like, yes, absolutely. Uh, it was not until I spoke to Canned Heat's manager that I realized we would need to do this one a little differently. Uh, you know, because at first we, we were just sort of like, the, I don't know, the idea was to, it, it was a lot more like just a straightforward, here's what happened kind of a thing. When I spoke to uh, Canned Heat's manager, we start talking, he's very polite, and then he interrupts me and goes, listen, what's the approach of this going to be? Because I've got five other people also with Woodstock Books who want to interview me today. And that was when I realized like, oh, okay, we really need to do something to differentiate ourselves from what else is out there. And, you know, eventually I, I just sort of realized like, hmm, everyone I know at least has like an uncle who was there. And as soon as you get them started on, you know, that's two hours, right? They're just talking. <laughs> and I just, I figured like, let's just get as much as we can from these people. Uh, you know, and part of that was just by necessity because like Pete Townsend is not doing interviews anymore. Uh, Billy Cox from Band of Gypsies is not doing interviews. Like there were a lot of people who just, we're done. We're not talking anymore. Mm -hmm. Read what we said 10 years ago. You want to talk with you. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of, alarming actually like how many people who I sort of associated with the you know the hippie movement and all that were just kind of total assholes I guess maybe is the, is the word I would use Thank you for but it, that. yeah but but it became you know but it became clear that audience members not only wanted to talk about it but sort of felt like no one has talked to us yet there were half a million of us there and no one has asked us how it was. Uh, and that's, you know, and that sort of led to, you know, Woodstock really became this myth for people who were not there, like myself, I was not even born yet. Uh, and I think the myth, I think people sort of have gotten it confused with that old Coke commercial, I'd like to teach the world to sing. Uh -huh. Everyone's just holding hands in a meadow and there's not a cloud in the sky and everything, you know, it, it wasn't like that at all. <laughs> Uh, I was astonished to find out how much it was not like that and, you know, how much like toil went into it, you know, for people who were in the audience. And I was like, why has no one talked about this? This is, this is, there's half a million people out there I could talk to. Each one will have a different story. Each one approached the weekend differently. Each one said different things about the performance, all of it. And, um, you know, I, I would love to say that, like, we started off with the idea of we're going to interview attendees. That's what we're going to do, not how it happened. And, you know, I mean, this happens, though, sometimes, like, when you're in the early process of figuring out what your book is going to be. Like, it takes a little time to be like, okay, that's the direction. Um, but I got great stuff from lots of people, and I, I still hear from people. Uh, there was one woman uh, who told me she just did not enjoy herself at the festival. She did not care for it. She did not have a good time. And at first she was like a little reluctant to speak to me because she thought by saying that it was gonna somehow interfere with the, you know, with what I wanted to do and what the public perception of the festival was. And I was like, no, if you didn't have a good time, say so and we'll put it in. And she did. And I got an email from her like a year after the book came out and she said, I just wanted to tell you that the, ex the experience of being interviewed for your book and included w gave me this huge, wonderful sense of closure on that whole thing that I realized had been weighing on me all these years. Uh, and she was like, I'm, and I'm so happy it turned out that way that I gave my nephew an autographed copy of your book. So, you know, and when, I want to say that that's one of the things about these things where you don't know when you drop the seed or the, the pebble in the pond, how it's going to ripple out. And you guys did a very great thing for me because I'm not sure which one, which, which one of you had mentioned it, but uh, as we were interviewing, we were discussing, well, I said I went with four guys. I thought it was five, but I miss, I got confused. I was the fifth. And I think one of you said, well, have you ever gone back to see or connect with any of them? 
And I said, well, one of them was my boyfriend and he's deceased, so I know he's not here with us. But the other three, I never actually tried to, to find them after all these years. So I did what you had suggested and just went on the internet and typed a few names. And I'm on some other site called the Flushing, Friends of Flushing, which is where me and these four guys live during the time. Yeah. And I mentioned that I was looking for these different friends. And two weeks later, to the, to the fact of you planting that seed, I received a text from Bobby Moore, one of oh. the ones who I went with, who when we went to sleep during Janis Joplin, he stayed up and watched the whole show. Well, he said, I've been trying to find you for 40 years. Are you Gail Schneider? Because he didn't know my married name. Oh. And that's how we found each other because you suggested, well, have you ever found them? And it's led to this wonderful thing. We send each other's gifts. We were supposed to get together in New York during, uh, before COVID had happened. So yeah. we had to change our plans, but we plan to hug each other in the near distant future. And they'll have been over 40 something years. And we got to share and fill in the pieces of the story that were missing that each of us remembers, you know, when you go to Woodstock, it, people ask us questions as attendees. It was over 50 years ago. How sharp is your memory? <laughs> also, also, there may have been some drugs taken. Well, I found out. <laughs> it I must be that. true. <laughs> I, I thought right, we yeah. only brought pot and hash, but I found out apparently we brought every drug with us. So I didn't even know until I reconnected to my friend. Right. <laughs> you were a youth. That's a good thing. <laughs> yes. And it was really wonderful because we both cleared up a few missing pieces for each other. And I loved hearing his response of what it was like watching Janice while we're sleeping, you know, on a little site where we had our car and we're sleeping in a little tent. So I just want to thank you. That was a really, that, you know, I have another story I'll share later, but that one was a beautiful reconnection to someone who'd been looking for me for 40 years. So thank you. Well, I mean, the more, the longer I worked on it, the more I, like, it really came home to me that it was like, these are real people. This was a big deal for them. And, you know, even many years later, they're, this was this hugely pivotal moment in a lot of their lives. And you have to be respectful about that. And you have to, um, you have to listen and you, you have to just kind of let them talk and say what they have to say about it. It's, it, I found pretty early on that it was not really a discussion I could steer. Like I was, I was really not in control of it. It was really a lot more like you do your thing, you do it. And they, had a lot to say as as it turned out and i was i was happy to i i saw myself i think more as like a facilitator or custodian for these people as opposed to the writer i realized i was taking this experience that meant a lot to them and we're preserving it so when they go away this is always going to be here and no one can take that away uh, and one of them who made it into the book even said I'm really glad you're doing this before we all die so. I, no, I gave a copy to every one of my children. I don't know yeah. how much it means to them now, but maybe it'll mean something later. Though one of them commented that she keeps it on the coffee table and when her friends come in. <laughs> so okay. some of the younger generation is aware of, of Woodstock. But in fact, this I have to add this in right now about Karen. When you and I did our first interview, which which was completely off the cuff for me, something happened and our recording didn't work and somehow Karen Matsu Greenberg got involved. And could there have been a better mistake ever? No. Because now this woman is in my life and I love her as a sister and a friend. And it's more than just, it's, it's not just an acquaintance because she produced the Bootstock book and invited me to be at the panel with you guys. Right. It's really a loving, close connection that she means the world to me. So, if you hadn't made that error, chances are her and I would not have met and all with, this great with, stuff happened. What Gail is talking about is that we recorded the interviews with Dan recorded a hundred hours plus of people. And then we dictaphoned it. We had it all typed up and then we brought it into manuscript form. So you're talking about your initial recording with Dan and how yes. I got involved. But I think what's really interesting is 
you're talking, you know, Dan talks about being a custodian. And for me, meeting you, Gail, and the things you talked about, about reconnecting with Bobby, it's like all of these doors open through this book. And a custodian opens doors into the rooms, you know, and lets people into the room. And I have, it just keeps revolving since we've done the book. The stories that have come back to me and, 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 and reflected back to me from people that I met through the creating it with you. And they just blow me away. And like, you know, Dan, you said, like finally understanding, oh, this is something I have to take seriously. I, my job was sort of, um, <clears throat> as producer, I also had a hand in, you know, I wrote in my bio to you, Gail, that I feel like this was my capstone of my career. What I mean by that is I knew enough about a, a four color illustrated book and about how to hire the right author who was gonna find the right copy editor and we were gonna create the right kind of single page vignettes and the designer was gonna be able to tie in something even though tie dyes weren't in 1969, they so much epitomized the era. And then my girlfriend got involved. So all these people contributed. For me, when I, I was so I, helping with local photography and helping to organize the photography and some local um, people for Dan to interview, I would meet people and get their names and numbers. and like, oh, Dan, do you want to speak with this person? Yeah. And in speaking to one of these people and finding out if they should speak with Dan, she gave me an amazing quote, which stopped me in my tracks which became a spread in the book, which has to do with the fact that Max Yasger did not ask any of the other farmers. And they were all upset with him on an agricultural level, on a community-based level. And that actually sort of set a zeitgeist for the county for these 50 years of the farmer and the hippie can't be friends because Max brought in community without being true to his community. So what I've learned from Woodstock is how to bring the farmers into the politics of my life, how to integrate people that I wouldn't have previously spoken with. But I live in their county. They've been here for generations. I'm only here 25 years, you know. So how do we integrate? How do we take the truer zeitgeist of what we feel Woodstock was, which is the peace and the music, and that it all comes from love and it all goes back to love. It starts from love. It is love. How do we take that now for kids who, you know, don't know? They just don't know. They don't know things we know. They're like so far removed from it. And this, this brings up a point that Dan was saying uh, in our uh, talking earlier, which was about uh, people seem to always want to try to recreate Woodstock. Right. And if you could talk a little bit about that, Dan, I because you are in the field of this music world, and I never, when the other ones were coming up, I said I can't go to that. There was there'll be nothing like this one experience. You can't recreate something that was magic that happened spontaneously with nobody planning it. I mean, they were planning for fifty thousand, not for four or five hundred thousand. I I find that generally, attempts to recreate magical things, do not work. And I, it, I, I sort of figured it out, like, in, just for my own personal life, too, that I realized the source of all the unhappiness in my life has been when something fantastic happened to me. So I wanted to replicate it again. And you cannot ever do that. It is not possible. And it took me several decades to finally get that into my head. But, you know, but it's the same thing. And um, when I was, I was doing some promotion for the book and uh, you know, Michael Lang was supposed to put on a 50th anniversary thing and it didn't work out. And, you know, people were asking these like really ignorant questions about why it didn't happen. It's like, um, let me think, uh, you know, I mean, you, you need, if you're going to do a festival of that size, everything has to be, you have to have your venue locked in like a year in advance. There are a lot of regulations now. There are a lot of rules and a lot of them are because of Woodstock and the way the community reacted, like Karen was saying, uh, Governor Rockefeller at the time immediately drew up the Mass Gathering Act, so this could never happen again. Oh. And I, I, but I mean, ironically, a lot of, a lot of those um, measures that they put into place after Woodstock were what stopped the 50th anniversary of Woodstock. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question I kept getting was like, well, why can't he just do another one? Which is, yeah, how you know how much time do you have 
for why can't, why can't he do it? And it, it actually made me feel a little like territorial and protective of him because, you know, he, people were saying horrible stuff about him uh, oh, for not being able to get the 50 is It's awful. Yeah. And, and it's like, he does not have a red button on his desk that he can press and there's a festival. Does not work that way. The expectations uh, on him were so high that it caused him such huge stress. But yeah. and it, it was actually what ultimately occurred that year was wonderful, which is that he came to Gerald's yeah. Yeah, his farm. He came to Gerald's and Roy's encampment and there was a reunion of some of the most inside important people in his life. And that was the magic that re culminated, but it was so private and personal. It was Hanley and Michael and Rona and Gerald and one other guy, I don't know him, but he was at the drum circle and they were uh, sitting at Max's kitchen table. Wow. And that was the 50th anniversary there inside the room. And then they came out later and they all opened up the drum circle. But when he came to Matt Yazra's farm, they went into the kitchen and sat at the table and had a, a bourbon or something. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I had one interaction with him at the festival. Uh, I was 14 at the time and I was oh. in the 10th row was where we sat. But if you wanted to stand, you could get up within like four rows of the front of the stage. So uh, my friends rolled a complete joint of hash. So it had like a lot of weight to it. Yeah. And I threw it from there, you know, fourth <laughs> row all the way up into it. And he caught it with his hand. And I was just, I just, I thought he was the cutest man imaginable with the curly hair. He's, he's the, he's just like this, the epitome of the flower child. He was the, yeah. the gorgeous curly haired guy that yeah. every girl would want. Yes. So that was my whole interaction, but I still feel thrilled to know that I gave him a joint. <laughs> he, was, he was a really, he was a really good guy. He was very yeah. generous with his time when I talked to him. He, I, I don't know what I'd say, like maybe 30% of the book he was responsible for just from the interview that I had with him, he, he sat on the phone with me like all day. And That's wow. that, was, that was a call that I was, I was really expecting him to be sort of like Kurt and wow. okay, yeah, yeah. And maybe we would get one good quote out of him. I think we talked for like three hours and oh he, really, yeah. And I mean, he really indulged me and he, he's someone who did not have to indulge me. He gained nothing by indulging me. But that's the kind of guy he was, and this this meant something to him. Uh, I yeah, and he's got three other books that he's promoting simultaneously, and yet he right. took the time to really tell you the story that you were asking. Right. You know, I uh, I had the opportunity to sit in his kitchen two years later. It was just a very odd because I hadn't met him. You spoke with him, Dan. And I was all still in awe as you know the, the groupie hippie on the outside. I had this opportunity to meet him two years later sit in his beautiful, very simple stone floor kitchen on a, on, a, on a farm table and listen to him talk with his wife and a few other people there. Um, and he was very respectful of the book. He was really, you know, we had never, I'd sent him a copy, but he never came back to us, Gail, and said, I received it, blah, blah, blah. He just went on with his life, you know. But here it was, he was like, oh, thank you. You guys did a really nice treatment of it, you know. Oh. And that was just so believing and you know it was a blessing but I knew we did a, a, the right treatment as I said all these doors have opened up including sitting in his freaking kitchen table there yeah. in Mount Tremper I was like sitting there because of the book I was like well I'm here you know <laughs> it was just I, I had to say because it's part of my bio that I was at Woodstock and because of the bio that I have that says that I was in this book by Dan Buxman Every show that I go on as a guest, that's not my podcast, they always want to talk about Woodstock. It doesn't have to be the anniversary. It's any time of the year. They find it a fascinating subject that they want to ask you questions about. You and guys I never know, thought- you know, it's like intimate details, the two of you, it's- it, you know, But who thought of that? You know, when I was 14, I didn't know we were making history. I'm shooting my first roll of film and now there's pictures of Country Joe in your book. And he lives right around our area here. I've been trying to say, I've been sending him on Facebook. These are the pictures I took of you, you know, uh, 53 years ago. <laughs> well, I wouldn't have been re whatevered if not for you guys. So I was wondering about, like, I know there was 
some guests that you were able to uh, speak with, some rock stars. And I was wondering if either of you could share something about some of the people you spoke to or what they were like on any comments they might have said. And I'm wondering, did any of them give you feedback like, we loved the audience or we never had an audience like that before? Or how did the musicians feel up there looking back at all of us? I, I with the musicians, I spent a lot more time just talking about like the lengths they had to go through just to get from the hotel to, to the site, uh, which was a nightmare uh, that it, it, it consumed a lot of ink, I think is what they would say, to the point where like I had to sort of like start cutting that down and you know because otherwise there's going to be this whole book about a road being closed. <laughs> <laughs> not great, you know, not, not everyone is looking for that. And um, they, they never, you know, they didn't say anything specifically about like, there was this one audience member who did this thing, but uh, they, you know, they all remarked on how, you know, everyone was very polite and respectful and uh, there was no problem. I, look, for me, the defining characteristic of Woodstock is that nobody got hurt. And if you look over the history of these rock festivals generally, that's really unusual because every, almost every other rock festival that you know that you research and look up, something happened. Uh, I think sometimes just when you get people in crowds, they start just getting rowdy. Uh, Chip Monk, uh, who you know was doing, oh yeah, also when they were building the stage. Yeah, he he said that he thought part of the reason why it went as well as it did was because it rained at the perfect time. And if you've, you know, if you've ever organized a festival, rain is like, that's your worst nightmare. You don't want that to happen. Uh, it's sort of unavoidable in the Catskill Mountains. Mm -hmm. It's especially in the summertime. Uh, but no, he, he really felt like that, that helped people sort of get this sense of collective, you know, we're all in this together. together. Mm. We must put our best foot forward for the rest mm -hmm. of the world to see. Mm -hmm. And we must keep it together no matter what happens. Uh, and that I think is a lot of why it's still remembered is, you know, no one, no one got shot, you know, uh, there was, it was that one fist fight, not one. And, you know, I mean, a, a lot of it also really, uh, was because of marijuana, if you want my honest opinion, uh, and they should just, in my opinion, like pipe that in through the ventilating systems <laughs> of ever of like, you know, football arenas. So people will just calm down. That's the game. We gave so much away. We shared it with everyone when we were there. Yeah. We were we were not like the woman who experienced it as an unpleasant thing. Right. We were the people who came so over prepared that we had so much food and drinks and water and 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 drugs, and we shared it with everyone around us. And it was so we experienced that as a beautiful thing. The only so we didn't have that part of the stress that some other people had, because some people just thought, oh yeah, we're going to the concert. We don't need to bring anything. Yeah. We packed a trunk full of food. And <laughs> yeah, that was smart. Actually, the, the woman who I spoke to who did not have a good time also said everybody was sharing everything. You know, she, she completely acknowledged what was going on. It wasn't anything, oh, like, uh, but her thing was, she said, she just described herself as not really much of an outdoor person. And she brought one of those wheelie suitcases with her to the. <laughs> so oh, wow. it's maybe not the best. Not the idea. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I mean, you, you have, if you're going to be in that kind of an environment, you have to be, you know, check your dignity at the door. You're you're going to get muddy. It's going to be a mess. Just accept it. It's fine. You'll survive. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think for a lot of people who are like, ooh, that's dirty, you know, they can't, they can't really get, that's hard for them to get past. Well, the mud was so thick. Yeah. It had a certain stench to it mm -hmm. that I didn't find, un, un, you know, it didn't bother me, the stench, but the mud would hold you. How manure stench, scale. Well, if you, it's right, it was probably mixed of manure, right? So if you lifted up your foot, the shoe would stay in the mud. So you'd have to get <laughs> the shoe out. Yeah. <laughs> But go on, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> we're just we're just shooting this shit here. This is yes. <laughs> Um No, but I, uh, as far as musicians that I talked to, um, I, you know, they did. I mean, they didn't really say much about the crowd, other than you know they're flying in on a helicopter and they're like, 
holy shit, I've never seen that many people in one place in my life. Wow. Um, I honestly, I think the fact that they didn't really have anything to say specifically about audience members just says to me, like nobody did it, nobody was acting up, uh, nobody was causing a problem. Melanie uh, felt that uh, she was accepted by the world, you know, she was so young, she was 19, and everybody lit the candles up. And she like, felt like she this? was in a living room. Who is this? Melanie. Oh, Melanie. Melanie. She felt like she was in a living room. And, you know, because she had only otherwise really performed in living rooms, you know, and in places yeah. where maybe 30 or 100 people have been. So there she is on stage. She said she just, instead of getting freaked out by it, she just really felt loved. And, and, and it was interesting because she's continued to sing. She sings with her daughters. And she wasn't... Uh, she was sort of discovered there, right, Dan? You know, like she was nobody until she showed up there. And it really inspired her, honestly, to go on with her life and be that kind of peace and loving person. Yeah. Um, she said, she had, you know, she did, she had this one song basically, or she had three really, but uh, the original song that, uh, the Beautiful People song was such a, a spiritual anthem of peace mm -hmm. that she sort of defined that way. And so she decided to own it. Yeah. <laughs> so that changed her life completely in the way the audience reacted to her. Yeah. And that was weird because Dan and I were like, oh my God, there are so many people. Can you, how are we gonna get through them all? And I was like, I'll call Melanie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so how, how many people did this launch their musical career at Woodstock? Well, uh, certainly. Uh, <laughs> Dan, well, hers, you know? hers Hers for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Santana is like the most obvious example because they'd never really played for anybody before. And then it was just off to the races after that performance. I'm going to see him and then on next tomorrow, August 19th. Oh, awesome. <laughs> uh, I, that, we, Santana, we did not stop dancing. That was some of the most amazing high energy music. And, and you know, he lives in the Bay Area here where I am. Right. And he is just an amazing human being. Thinking about Carlos Santana. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, the, the whole band was great. Every, everyone in the band was, you know, just the absolutely phenomenal elite musician. Uh, you know, that goes for everybody. Like, you know, Michael Shreve, Greg Rowley, you know, everyone on that stage was elite, That's as true. elite as it got. Uh, and I'm not surprised at all, you know, you know, when you talk, when you think about like the time they went on the amount of sunshine that was, you know, there's just everything aligned perfectly when they hit the stage. So I, them, I, th I think it was them and Sly and the Family Stone. Dan, was, the amount of sunshine, can you talk about that some more? Uh, me or Gail? You, Dan. Oh, uh, just suddenly, you know, there had been raining all morning. Uh, they'd had to clean off the stage because it was so wet. And that's why they had um, John Sebastian come up. Uh, because it was, yeah, you know, it was the photos. yeah right yeah he just had a, <laughs> yes <laughs> right and he he was able to just like buy them a little time while they get the water off stage and then suddenly the clouds part and it's ladies and gentlemen santana you can't create these things you know you can't you can't manufacture these things and you know you always hope I'm sure that, you know, that every band goes down well and everyone likes everything and there are bathrooms for all, you know, and all that, but, you know, this, this was really the first time. Yes. And, uh, you know, certainly at, at that size, I don't know if, I don't know if people who are not there are aware of how many people were there. They know the number, half a million, but that doesn't mean anything to them un until you're sitting in that crowd among that many people, it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, uh, I, I can yeah. say that to be true. And there were characters that came through the crowd, like the, and, and I found out just recently about one of them. He ended up founding the like animal rights. He was the guy that was naked running around carrying a sheep. And when we first started in Saturday morning, it wasn't as crowded yet because people were still sleeping. So he yeah. could walk around with his sheep. But then wow. as it got crowded, he started carrying the sheep around and he had some kind of a sign about animals. And then I read later that he, he turned that into a whole career of protecting and saving animals and being an animal rights activist. So he wasn't just the wild, crazy guy running around naked carrying a sheep during the concert. 
<laughs> Look, a, lo a lot of people, not just musicians, a lot of people in the audience said that you said it even, uh, that it was just this turning point in their lives. Yeah. And, you know, they were able to just take that moment and parlay it into something for a long time. Uh, and the fact that it worked, I think, says a lot about the event itself, you know, because you, you just don't hear people, you know, talking about like, yeah, I had a booth at Altamont. You, yeah. don't, you don't hear that, you know, people don't, people don't reminisce about Woodstock 99. You know, it's like this, this was it. This was the one time when everything and aligned correctly. It wasn't just here, it was all over the world. Right. Because when I went to Italy with my husband on some computer work he was doing for the largest book publishing company there, Mondave or something like that. And I had posted a, I had just found myself in the 40, it was the 40 year anniversary and I found myself in the movie. Right. And I had never, I was, I'd always thought I must be there somewhere. And when I found it, I was so thrilled. I posted it on Facebook and the gentleman he was working for saw it and showed it to all the other people at the publishing company. And when my husband went to work that day to, you know, we flew in there for two weeks of work. The first thing they said to him was, well, before we start, can you show us the photos of your wife at Woodstock? <laughs> I mean, it, and then when I went to our bed and breakfast and he had heard I'd been there when I came down to eat, he put Jimi Hendrix on when I walked in for breakfast, blasting it from the yeah. Woodstock album. And I was like so shocked because I was thinking here in the United States, it was a big deal. But I didn't realize that it was a big deal in other countries. Oh, yeah. When we did well, when we did the 50th anniversary event, there were people from all over the world. Uh, I think as far as South Africa, who had come ju just on the strength of what, it, you know, they didn't, they seemed to me like very kind of like straight, you know, straight laced kind of people uh, who you would not think necessarily would be that interested in this sort of thing but it was really it cut across every uh demographic oh and some people and karen can back me up on this still hate it uh because we were we were doing one event at uh, a retirement home and we were signing some books there and this one you you remember what happened yeah, and this one guy who's like in his 80s walks by and he goes oh what the that was I said, Gail. <laughs> what yeah. did he say Oh. Those are the photos I sent you. Dan and I had, we were trying to book like marketing groups. Yeah. So the publisher called me and said, you know, this person wants to speak to you. So I said, okay, who are you? She said, I'm a uh, the cultural director at a retirement home. <laughs> I said, who better to talk with than some old people who might have been there? So Dan and I hustle, we get all dressed, we get our poster boards and our books. And I, I got to tell you, as an aside, it's the best photos I took of my life that day as the ones I sent you next to the fish tank and Dan and I. Yeah. Together. I mean, I never looked so good because we were so happy. We Dan meets in the audience of the 12 people who are wheeled up to listen to us. Dan meets the guy who was a radio announcer, right? Yeah. Right. Right. So he's this old guy who had been on a local radio station in Harlem. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, no, I, was, I wasn't talking about him. I just spent at one point, we, we're sitting there at the table in the lobby with our books. And this guy, 85 years old or whatever, comes walking by and he just, uh, he hated us. He oh, hated that us. guy. Oh, yeah, that guy. You remember. the radio announcer was so excited we were there. We were like the highlight yeah. of his month. He yeah. was like, oh, Mr. Bookspan, let's talk about this musician and that musician and this musician. And Miguel, he came back to life, Yeah, you know? He was so joyous. I was like, that's why we came. So you could meet this radio announcer who was in a local small WNYC studio underground in the 60s, you know, it was- Every person that I encountered in the course of doing this book, I learned something. So uh, much. Even yeah. if, yeah, even if they didn't like it, it was still like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. Right, right. Uh, here's, here's a photo of Gail at Woodstock, uh, okay. by the way. Uh <laughs> That's in your book. <laughs> That's Gail, and here's the book, everybody. This is the book we're talking about, which is the beautiful Woodstock 50 Years. This is the book that entered, that brought Gail and I together for a lifetime of love. And I will be adding in uh, lots of those yeah, photos like you're sending me. I'll be adding in to our, as we're talking about it, they will see the photo. They'll be posted your, in there. Great. Your That's most true. favorite photo. <laughs> no, but I mean, even like when I met people who, you know, did not have a good attitude about it or whatever, it was still, I don't know, I, I 
felt like even the people who had something bad to say about it were still kind of a part of it. In you some still way. had common ground, right? It, it, not, not even that. I was just curious, you know, 50 years later, why are we still talking about this? What, what keeps it compelling to people? Why does anyone still care? Why? Right. And this, this, this is the one everyone still cares about. You know, there's been Coachella and Burning Man and all that. And it doesn't, it just doesn't have the same, uh, when you say Woodstock to anybody, they know exactly what you're talking about. Yes. If, if I said to some, to some random person, Coachella, they might not know what I mean. Everyone knows what Woodstock was. And I don't, I have a hard time thinking of another event of any kind that people can just off the top of their heads just talk about it right there. Uh, and it certainly explains to me why, you know, they wanted to try to revive it a couple of times, you know, because it in the 90s, it became a brand. It was not the same thing anymore. And a lot of the people who I talked to were really upset about that because they, they felt like, you know, this was this magical thing. I felt that, that way. Um, so I, right. When I, the, I, uh, I can't remember their names now. The people on the on the album cover, cover uh, Ehrlich, Pam, and right, yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Um, when I was talking with the blanket, them, yeah, right. When I was talking to them, they were like, you know, we we've had every opportunity to try to make money off of this, and we refuse to do it because we think that this whole thing just belonged to everybody. This belonged to the world, and I I respect the hell out of that because I know if I could make one dollar off of it, I would. And I don't, I don't, I would just sacrifice my dignity for the golden dollar if I had to. But you know, but these people have really had an opportunity if they wanted to, to you know, make themselves into big Woodstock stars, and they were, and they refused. You know, they still get people asking them about it. They still get reporters coming to their house. They get tourists coming to their house. <laughs> I would not be crazy about reporters and tourists coming to my house. Right. But they, they really saw themselves as like emissaries for this thing. And that, you know, that as long as they're here, while they're still drawing breath, they're going to try and do everything they can to make sure people think of this as not just some thing that happened, to make sure that people think of it as this magical thing that was utterly unique and will never happen again. The other beauty is that, that, that couple stayed together all these years. How about that, yeah. And I, when that came up on the 50 year anniversary, cause they were interviewed for that. Yeah. Right? Seeing the two of them together and then seeing my vision of uh, this beautiful woman being held by her, her man with this blanket covered. And you could feel that the warmth and love in the photo. Mm -hmm. And it's still there today with yeah. this beautiful couple. They might've put on a little weight maybe, but whatever, you know, got a few gray hairs, but hey, their essence was still as lovely. Yeah, and yeah, so you true. Tell me that, it just makes my heart warm even more to know how true they were to being so the representative true. out of 500,000 people, the right photo was picked by the right yeah, people. Right. It, right. The whole thing meant something to everybody who went. And, you know, it, you know, I mean, other than like this one woman I talked to that I mentioned earlier, you know, and I'm, I'm sure there were people who didn't have a good time, you know, because that's just, law of averages everyone right. doesn't like everything you know um but it, it was very clear to me like right from the outset that i really needed to handle this with respect and treat the people with dignity uh because i think a lot of people have treated it like it was just this freak show and that nothing could be further from the truth and it it not only was not a freak show but it did not degenerate into something bad when there were not enough amenities or this happened or this happened. You, you just don't see that ever. So did it sort of crack the ice of like the Walter Cronkite, David Brinkley's vision of how we present what the world is and Woodstock because it was covered, you know, because the throughway was clogged as if it were an accident or crash emergency. And then when people were all got your attention, what is it, what is it, what is it? It's a concert of hippies who are uh, dropping daisies from planes. It's people open to get passing tents to each other. You know, it sort of, it broke the glass, I think, of like uh, what was really being promoted, I think, at the time, probably with the Vietnam War and the control the government really wanted to have on the population. 
uh, it was magical. And it basically did say, you know, in, in large groups, you can do anything. You're like ants, you know? Yeah, we right. can change things. We have power and we have control. I Maybe it's never been recreated again because they won't let us. You know, they don't want us to feel that power and control unless we're on a team. Well, you know, besides all the pot smoke, I think the psychedelics really also played a very important role the mood. in the, the honoring of we are one yeah. because uh, th there's part of that where the ego is, is removed and- well, And that's what came uh, out on the wall, we are one, right. Right. It, that was, you know, what was painted was what we felt, what you, you know, it wasn't- Exactly. Right. And even the people that maybe didn't have a good time, there's something that they got from this experience also yeah you i mean know, I, it might not have been the flowery whatever thing some of us had they learned something from being there oh there we are yeah we are yes, one there we are we i was sitting right there while that was being written yeah. and it was i always thought it was very powerful and you and as it was starting we we're like what is the person doing <laughs> Yeah, I right. And did they have was it spray paint or or I don't know. I thought it was like some kind of paint, but I don't know. I don't think it was spray, but I don't know. Yeah, it's it's like, or a brush or something. It yeah, like it brush. might have been a brush. Like a brush. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it, it it's that's amazing, Gail. You were sitting right there. I was sitting right there while that was being done. Next to it, well. And I I that's like such an important message for the world right now between everything that's going on. Was we flesh are all connected, flesh. you know. Yeah. We are, but in, in a way we're not connected at all. Uh, exactly. In, in, a way <laughs> in a way we've never been less connected, I feel like. Uh, you know, and a lot of that is technology. A lot, of, you know, I mean, I can't say that like when my son is listening to music, and it's on headphones, I can't say that bothers me. Uh, when I'm also on my own headphones listening to my music, I can't say that bothers me. So I, I have helped perpetuate this situation too. Isn't that uh, just a different kind of connection though, Dan? Yeah, no, I mean, we, we, we chat and, you know, we talk, to, <laughs> we talk to each other, but, you know, he's 15 now. And it's, that's just, parents are not, that popular, I find, with their kids when they yeah. hear about that age. Oh yeah. But what I cannot. Now that I'm add, losing my hearing, I wish somebody would have made me take my blasting music headphones off or prevent oh. me from sitting in front of the speaker when Grace Slick is screaming out uh, um, uh, "White Rabbit" there. So, uh, and now I'm paying for it. So, any young people out there, you really should try to protect your hearing because you will lose it. <laughs> What I, what I find amazing, really, is you were 14 when you went, yes. which is a year younger than my son is now. And I know if I had, if I had been 14 and gone to something like that, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I have what it takes. I'm like a sort of pretty indoor person, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, it, you know, and just, you know, when it, when it starts, uh, you know, raining and, and there's no food, it, you know, I'm, I'm the first person who's like, oh, well, you know, let's just get Chinese food. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a creature of now, I would say. Um, but I mean, I, every, everyone I talked to, uh, I, I think the oldest any of them were when they went was like 20 or 21. This was, this was young people. Uh, I'm now 52 and I look back on when I was 20 and I'm like, hmm, I was a total asshole and I really couldn't have kept it together at the time. This was true. Uh, I don't know how you all kept it together, really. Uh, you know, I, I, I can go by what I was told and what people have said and I, I get it, but I don't get it, you know, because I wasn't there and I wasn't a part of it. And, you know, I, I was always aware of that writing my book, like this can have every fact in it, you know, all the, you know, all the T's, you know, line every T, dot every I, but you're still, it's still not possible for me to somehow put into the book what it was like to be there, because I wasn't there, so well, I'll never have that. This makes me, brings up an interesting question for me. What was it, we as attendees were sitting in the center of it all, mm -hmm. so we know what we're giving you back and feedback. Right. And what we experienced. But now I'm wondering, I hadn't thought about it. 
maybe these rock musicians who were just flown in for six hours and then flown out or who did, maybe they didn't experience what we were having there. I mean, maybe they saw everything from above, but did they get the spiritual and energetic implications of this amazing mass of people in a loving way? Or did they just zip in, play their music and leave and say, oh, that was another concert? There were, there were some artists that I talked to and that was exactly how it was for them. Uh, Sweetwater, for example, the woman, I, their singer uh, who I talked to uh, said they didn't even know Woodstock was a big deal until they left, went back to Los Angeles and turned on the news. Like they had no idea about what this thing was. Um, and I also, I think it didn't really become that until Santana performed. I think that's really when it became Woodstock. Uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you were asked, you were asking before about like, you know, the artists that had turned into overnight stars, you know, that sort of thing. There are also artists who it didn't do anything for, uh, cause they just, you know, they weren't right for the crowd or they played on the wrong day. Uh, you know, it's it, timing Keith is Hartley. everything. What's that? Keith Hartley band. Who are they? Yeah, they were, yeah, it just wasn't the incredible string band. Oh, I, no, I like, no, 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 no. Oh, for us folkies love the Incredible Spring Band. I love, I love the Incredible so. Spring Band, but they went on at the wrong time. And uh, <laughs> no, no less an authority than Wavy Gravy told me that. So uh, a lot of it is it just, you know, <laughs> if you're if you're on a, you know, if you're on the bill, and it starts raining. Well, Wavy didn't didn't Wavy set the choreography of it? I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, I did a retreat with Wavy Gravy oh, many, yeah? many many years later. What a lovely soul. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, he has he had a camp up here in Northern California. I think he still does a circus camp where children. So a friend of mine, a father and a daughter went and signed up for the two week circus camp mm. and had the time of their lives. Yes. And yes. he taught that they would teach you all different circus acts and circus yes. things. Okay. And he's just, you know, he's really walked the talk or whatever the words are. Uh, and he did some amazing work there, helping with people who were having, uh, you know, whether it was needs of food or, or you know, they, they set up, like, I think it was a hog farm. What was it? The, yeah, right. see, I didn't get to see any of those things at Woodstock because we didn't need any of that. Right. So I mm -hmm. never went to any food booth or any, you know, services. The only thing we were looking for was the bathroom and that was gone already, you know? <laughs> um, and the reason it was gone that people should know is it wasn't like they didn't set up a lot of porta potties. They did, but the truck that has to come in to empty them for the next uses could never get in there to empty any of them out, and that's why they were closed. Yeah, you know, did you guys have tents like far down the road or something so you could like porta potty yourself we, out of there? Or we parked somewhere that was a walking distance. That was like there was an area where people had parked cars and you could put up a tent or do something. I had never camped or done anything in the wild of nature yes, all in my life. So I slept in the back seat of the oh. car. I mean, I went with four guys who were 19 years old and I was 14. So they all slept outside in their sleeping bags, no tent. And I slept in the back seat of the Chevy Impala. Well, that's great. That's great. <laughs> I'm still a virgin then. So <laughs> love it. That's I'm trying, I'm I'm trying to picture my son. Uh, he's like, okay, bye, Dad. I'm going away for the weekend with these four 19-year-old women. I was <laughs> but uh, I had an unconventional family. I told yeah. my dad I was going, and he said, "Have a good time." I mean, there was no. I was able to do what I wanted when I wanted, and I think that's probably why I was the mature one in our group who yeah. handled collecting money so that we had enough to buy foods and things. I was very organized, hmm. so uh, I think I was probably. 14 maybe going on an, an older age at the time <laughs> you're you're one of the only people i spoke to who was like actually prepared you, yes. you not only brought food you also brought a camera when people did not bring cameras with them much my uh, first camera it was a, called a beauty light yeah and I, it was i think it was a beauty light and my father had gotten it he worked in a gas station and guys would come by to sell hot items that were stolen oh. And so he bought this camera and I think paid 50 bucks or something. And I said, oh, I'm going, he said, here, you can have the camera. So he gave me the camera and that's the first roll of film I ever shot. Wow. The point is that I had the negatives. It was all black and white. 
Right. And I had the negatives and I lent it to somebody back in the eighties who wanted to make some Woodstock photos or something. And I never saw the negatives again, but I'm so grateful to at least have the original stills. You know, they even have the name in those days, they put August 69. So you'd know the month you took the picture would be yeah. printed on there. And I'm grateful for all the traveling and, you know, communes I lived in that I still even had these to, to give to you when you asked if I had any photos. Exactly. It was amazing. Yeah. It was, uh, anyways, I was happy to have these available. And I was also interviewed in, for two different different years for newspapers so that newspapers have always been looking for people when the anniversary comes up. They want to know someone they can talk to about that event. And that doesn't seem to stop. It's always, you know, this is August 17 yeah. and here we are 53 years. So what, what else would you like to share about this experience of writing this and how did it change your life? Oh, um, well, in terms of how it changed my life, I now have something on my resume with a word that pops out at potential employers and they go, oh, that's, wow, that's neat. Uh, it opened a lot of doors for me uh, in like, in terms of my other writing, that sort of thing, you know, because before that <clears throat> I had, the books were a little like not a topic everyone could relate to. And this, this was the first thing that like anyone who looked at was like, Oh, okay, Woodstock, that's your name on the spine. So that it was it was really good for me in that sense. But it would, you know, it was also it sort of demonstrated to me like don't take projects that you're not interested in. Uh, because you're gonna you're gonna be working on this for a while. And for, certainly for a subject like this, it really demands that you really like, you know, roll up your sleeves and really get in there in a way that you can't do if you're not interested. Uh so you know, I mean I I only take book projects now if they're like really interesting to me and I and I could really see just losing myself in it for a long time uh before Woodstock it was just anyone I'll take anything from anyone who has anything to give me which is sort of the standard you know starving writer song mm -hmm. um but yeah it, it changed a lot for me and uh I got another book that I just finished uh, a couple of months ago uh, the work continues. I am not relying on books to pay rent. That was also uh, something I finally figured out. It's like, this is not really where the money is, but I love these projects. And the idea of not doing them uh, to me is like tragic. Yeah. And you just, it, it's one of those things it, in a way it's very Woodstock. It's like, okay, uh, it's raining in the middle of the day. Uh, we have millions of people here who we, thousands of people here who we can't feed. Continue. You have, <laughs> you have to just go on, you know, and you, you can't get too caught up in the past or what was, you know, and you certainly can't, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I have five books out now and I'm 52 years old and I know people in my same position who are very bitter about it, that they're not famous. Because they thought, you know, you know, you know, whatever they wrote, you know, that's the rocket ship to start them. It just doesn't work that way. You know, that's just not a realistic way of looking at it. Um, well, as Karen can say, I'm sure the publishing industry has changed drastically because yeah. of the internet and online books, and you know, all of these different ways of reaching people now have changed, and it's you know, that's positive and negatives like there is with everything. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had, there are certain book ideas I've had in my head for like years that I had to finally sort of accept, like, this is probably not going to happen. Uh, you know, because the, you know, like the heavy metal book that I did, the new wave, you know, and the Woodstock book too, lots of graphics, lot, you know, and that's the uh, photos oh. are expensive, all that sort of thing. And, it, and uh, you know, publishing companies don't want to pay to make any book that they don't feel absolutely certain will sell billions of copies, like right. cookbooks and the Michelle Obama memoir. If you, if it's not one of those, you know, don't bother. I, uh, while you brought up the heavy metal, I just wanted to make sure, and also for our listeners, there is a. I didn't realize they were heavy metal because yes. I don't know, we didn't know what heavy metal is, but it's a Mongolian band that just toured in the country here called The Who. Not uh, our band with Pete Townsend, but H-U. H-U, yeah. And they have a song on it called Song of Women, Song of Woman. That's a really powerful, empowering song for the respect of women. Mm 
-hmm. And uh, it's a heavy metal band and they're becoming so incredibly good. popular. So yes. I just want to be sure if you hadn't heard them, have you heard them, H.U.? Yes, oh, yeah, I love them. I heard, I heard of them from you. You were yeah. not <laughs> together, yes. That might have been like the second thing you said to me. Like, oh, you know, okay. The first was like, thank you for the phone call. And the second was, have you heard of the who? <laughs> Um, no, I mean, there, there's no other band that I'm aware of making music that sounds like that. Nobody. No, it's Mongolian Ever. modern. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. You're not, not going to see a lot of that. I, I don't see, like, you know, who mania sweeping the country and everyone wants their own, like, Mongolian heavy metal band now. I, I think <laughs> they're a, a pretty unique thing. Yes. There. But, uh, I don't, you know, I mean, it, it does still sort of go back to the original topic, though, where I think you know, the musically, the hippie movement just broke everything wide open. You could do, you could do anything after that. Uh, that's what we all owe that movement, in my opinion. Uh, you know, regardless of, you know, whatever other issues or whatever, the, they made it possible for, you know, musicians who were just like learning little blues licks to just go all the way off in this direction. Or, you know, it, it just to play, it sitar in, to play sitar in rock music. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I mean, a lot of that uh, we owe to acid. Uh, and I think that that has to be acknowledged. Uh, I think the role of marijuana in keeping crowds mellow needs to be acknowledged because, you know, these are things for future for future use. You know, it's like if, if we want, you know, now that marijuana is legal in some states, you know, I, I don't see any reason why, you know, it's it isn't this more like widespread thing. For, well, you know, for the good of the country, for everyone to just be stoned all the time. Well, no, I just mentioned that uh, when I was talking, when I was visiting with Timothy Leary, I just mentioned this on the last show, that um, he couldn't understand why when he was in prison, he could get any drug he wanted. He can get pot, anything, anything he wanted. He said, but you couldn't get any alcohol. Nobody would bring in alcohol. And I don't know why you can't. So he made it. Yeah. He made the alcohol. He gave it to the prisoners. And then violence and anger broke out. And yeah. he said, this is a Republican drug alcohol. Totally. And, it, and he learned right then and there why it was not available to prisoners where they could get any drug that they wanted. Yeah, I mean, if, if, you've, if you've been around any seriously drunk person at any time in your life, uh, you'll know, okay, don't multiply this by 500,000 and put them all in a field. Right. That's exactly. a problem. Yeah, and I have so, to say, yeah. I can't remember ever seeing alcohol. Like I didn't, I don't remember, I'm sure some people were drinking, but I didn't see it where I was sitting in my group. We didn't bring any beer or wine or uh, anything the, like that. The woman, the woman who did not have a good time yes. brought a bottle of wine oh. <laughs> in, her, in her suitcase. So maybe, maybe that's something. Yes. She no, it just, it, it was true. <laughs> right. It just it wasn't that it wasn't that kind of crowd. And you know, and my understanding also is just in the 60s, there was this real like line between like the parents who were drinking and the kids who were doing all the other drugs. It was it was very much like tribal almost in that sense. Uh you know, and I mean I I'm not really a big drinker myself. I don't really enjoy it. Uh but I do remember that every time I had some horrible experience that I wished had not happened, alcohol was usually present. It's, it's just not great. I'm just, I'm just not a fan of it. And I don't like the way it makes other people behave. I don't, you know, just it's- It doesn't I, I belong wish, in the large crowd. Smoke, I want everyone to just smoke pot. It's yeah. so much better. <laughs> Please, yes, give it a try. Yeah. For the glaucoma, come on, you know. Uh, yes, that's definitely for the glaucoma. So Karen, <laughs> How did you producing this book, I know it, 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 you had a friendship already with Dan, but how did doing this book affect your life? What did it do to put you on a different path or did it affect you in any way producing it? Is this the last book that you produced? How were you feeling about this? Well, I thought it was going to be the last book I produced, um, but what it actually uh, brought me to was the realization uh, after 30 some odd years in, in the publishing industry was that everything, every story has really been told before. And unless there was a unique and original story that, again, promoted 
the goods of society, the local goods that you could really tangibly connect with, that there is no point in me producing anything. And so <clears throat> unfortunately, Dan, well, let me say, fortunately, Dan offered me a wonderful job, which was a great music project, but then COVID hit and the whole thing fell apart. And that I felt that was an interesting project about a certain band from Toronto that we all love so well. But um, because that band had a following that uh, it's Rush and the band has a following that is heavily male, but not very violent, very supportive of love and camaraderie. So I thought, well, that's something to be involved in. It didn't happen for a number of reasons. I did get involved in another set of books, which is a series of 12 books, one for every month that highlight a different local family farm in the Hamptons. So because it was community farming, honor farming, family farming, 12 very beautiful books with cloth covers, I decided to do those. So that's the thing I've done post Woodstock, but there's like, I don't really have the need to publish anything else after this book because it honestly, it, the conversations that I had personally um, with the few people I spoke with, the meeting that we had at Bethel Woods in the giant room, the center there where we launched the book together, these things were seminal. You know, launching the book at Yazgur's farm and meeting other people who were original producers who we did not include in the book, but I've thus far, you know, thus they become friends with, it just put me on a different path in life that I don't really need to publish books anymore. I need to be part of a community that continues to talk about what this was. And I don't take psychedelics daily. I'm not a microdoser, although I don't just, I think it's fine. I think it's a great way for people to become more balanced actually and in tune with their neurology. Um, but for me, I want to try to have those kind of enlightened conversations with everyone I meet. So it's a little exhausting in the shopping center, you know, when I go grocery shopping. <laughs> I mean, Karen and I both like realized pretty early on, like this is not, this was not a normal book. Uh, this was not going to be the same kind of experience as we had had previously. Changed everything. I must say that Karen threw herself 10,000% into the entire project and was there in the mud with me as much as anybody and put everything she had into Thanks it. Thanks so much, Dan. Thank you. I had such great opportunities to incorporate my friends. You know, this designer yeah. I'd worked with for 20 years and love the work she does. Lynn Yeamans, just phenomenal. And Arlene Falcon, who did the tie-dye. She's my best friend's cousin. You know, it's like, it just all comes together. And Gail, she came to celebrate the book with us and went to her 50th camp reunion. So it's like, I'm telling you, these doors had opened for so many people along the way. Well, this is where I got to pop you. in our story together because I find this hysterical. I, I mean, you know. I did not know this Karen, except for speaking to her on the phone when she was helping with the redo of interviewing me. And we felt a really wonderful connection and we ended up talking for a really long time. And I just figured, well, maybe we'll be friends or we'll email or something. I don't know. Well, my birthday somewhere around May. My birthday's in May. And somewhere around May, I've got this, this, this plastic bin that I finally, my husband's been sitting there for, I don't know, two months. And finally, the night before, he says, oh, yeah, let's put that, let's put that um, uh, thing together. So we'll get so our container chairs <laughs> and whatever in it, you know you know, a plastic little uh, bench thing that lifts up and you put things in it. So I thought, God, this is so weird that he wants to help me put it together finally. So we put it together and I'm so happy. And then I go back in the house and then the next morning he says to me, you have to come outside. There's something I have to show you. And I'm thinking all this time, because he's he always likes snakes and reptile things. So I'm thinking, oh God, he's got a snake out there for me to look at. And we go out there and then the, next to my swimming pool, this box is moving around like this. It's moving like this. And all of a sudden the lid goes up and this woman jumps out who I've never met before with a basket of balloons and, and I don't know, <laughs> gifts and things. And she leaps out of the box. My husband has only met her 15 minutes earlier when he's sneaking her in to jump in the box. And she had the, the, the whatever foresight to do something so surprising 
He told me. It was his idea, Gail. I said, David, I'm coming to California. He said, oh my God. Oh my God, we have to surprise Gail. I said, I'm going to see my girlfriend in Eureka and Mendocino. So I'm coming right past you. I'm going to have to drive past. So, you know, it's an hour away, but it's all close. It's all within an hour. So I said, I have to come. He said, oh my God, we have to plan this. So then he calls me the next day. He said, can you like act like a gorilla? I'm like, uh, <laughs> yeah, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, well, get inside this box here and then make grunting noises. And I'll be like, Gail, what is that? <laughs> I didn't know that's where it came from. Was this? Well, you, the two of you did a great collaboration. And it it's we we I wait, was, I was, wait a minute. Wait, I jump out of the box and I go, surprise, and I look at this woman and she's looking back at me, and I think it's Gail, but she looks like she's 30 years old. And I'm like, is that the girl in the book? Is that the picture I saw? Who is that? How could she be 30 years old? And then I hear someone going, Oh my God. And I turn over here and that's Gail's daughter, Nancy. And wow. there's Gail. <laughs> and I was like, oh, and you're your, <laughs> just like the spitting image of you compared to what I, what I knew from the book and I had never met her before. It was this wild moment it was like, wait. <laughs> well, we embraced and we cried and we laughed and the bond was so- I'm never letting you go. <laughs> and it's what I feel like Woodstock was about was, you know, opening up your heart and letting other people in. And that's what her and I did. Even and so four or years later. Continued on. So I just want to thank you for that very hysterically fun story. It was and hysterical. I David's idea. <laughs> it was David's idea. But what it meant is that we're of like mind where he could throw me this folly and I could throw it back and say, yeah, oh, you're, you're a player, he <laughs> said. She's a Do player. Like, she's spontaneous <laughs> in life and share love, you know, and if not now, when? I, well, have, to say, I have to say also uh, COVID happening right after we did this book, which yeah. first of all, thank God Woodstock happened in 1969 and, and not 1970. Right. Uh, we would have spent all this time on this book and no opportunity to promote it or anything. Would have just gone into the sunset. And your first um, promotion was Bethel, uh, the Museum of Woodstock, which is in yeah, Bethel. We lost it, uh, was yeah, that the first center. book release party? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I mean, we did we did all kinds of like any promotional opportunity that anyone handed us, we took. Uh, I spoke on the Michael Savage show. <laughs> so uh, great. Yeah, just because it was I was like, fine, I'll take it. What? What I'll do you do want? It. Buy my book. We'll talk buy, my, about. Buy, my, buy my book. Uh, you know, we, I, I remember the famous quote uh, from when we were glamping. We just were both looking at each other. We were both like very wearied from a couple of days and holding these boxes of books. And I just remember us going like, if, if this doesn't sell after everything we did, then I'm out. That's I don't the, know. I don't know. Well, let me, let me tell you then that. But we're not out. So, right. I'm not, but no, let me tell you. So what happened is the book sell, is still selling. I went into the museum about at Bethel Woods Center of the Arts, which is where it would, would sell of all places. I went there um, about four weeks ago, I would say. Oh, okay. And I went into the ticket booth to get my parking pass for my season pass taken care of because they've got a great lineup this year. And I walked into the museum store and went, you know, sort of moseyed around and looked around the store and saw the book and was so excited, guys, because usually in the past, it was like sat flat in a, in a little cube in the, in the dark. And now it's face out under a spotlight closer to the t-shirts in the middle. And I'm like, so I'm at the front register. I was like, wow, actually, that's a beautiful book. Uh, and they're like, we love it. We think it's just great. And I said, is it Janice on the cover that you love or what is it? <clears throat> and they said, everyone who picks it up says, wow, this is such nice stories. I can read one story and the next story and because every spread is its own vignette, you know? So they're highlighting it at the Bethel Wood Center for the Art Museum bookstore, guys. And it's there and I thank them so much. Of course, I you know, continued our spiel, Dan. I was like, if you want to do an event, let me know. <laughs> <laughs>
Ask and your doctor if an the, event is right for you. The <laughs> photographer of that was Landy. Who was the photographer of the front one? Oh, it was Rothschild's is no, the front cover? No, Elliot Landy did the front oh, one. Oh, sorry. No, the cover is Elliot Landy. Thank you. The Janice pick is definitely Elliot Landy, and it's available for purchase on his website. Uh, I think the, the back photo and the inside photos. Yes. Our Annalise, and she, um, this is the site, folks. This is the, uh, this is the uh, headquarters of where the producer's office was in the field there behind the stage. So those are the kind of photos Amelie got, the inside picture. Um, I, they love, love, I love the organization of the book that it was going by and that you have a place where the person wants to, they can actually hear the music that you, you have with each thing. So I thought that was set up very beautifully. We still so, have our Spectrum link, even though it's an aspect, what's it called? Uh, Spotify. Spotify or Spotify link, yes. it's. Uh, so this is, <laughs> we're coming on a little over our hour. So this is the time where I ask, I'm gonna have one little last story to share, but I wanna have you guys share your last stories because remember stories can heal. And if you had something, whatever else you'd like to share now, this is the time for each of you to give your last bits of wisdom or whatever it is, promote anything, whatever you'd like to say. Karen? Karen? Um, well, what I'd like to say that the world has, we've learned since we've done this book, we've, we were exposed to so many people who still had comments, you know, was it good or was it bad? Where's the full spectrum? Then, as you all know, we went into COVID isolation worldwide. Now we're in a violence epidemic worldwide. We're trying to figure out how honestly can we teach our children to get back to this place. Um, the kids are scared. They've seen epide viral epidemics kill off populations. Yeah. They've seen guns in their school. They've lived with guns in their school. So they're wondering, what do you mean, mm. peace and love? And so. For me, honestly, well, honestly, I'll tell you this. There's a photo in the back of the book. It's only a 50 or three year old photo. It's the garbage picture. And there is no plastic in the garbage photo. It's what's missing, not what in, not what's in the garbage. Cause there's tents and there's sleeping bags and t-shirts, but there's no plastic. So how do we help these kids understand a world of fiber and natural resonance. And I really mean that resonance, frequency, vibration. And that's what Woodstock is and was and is and will be. And there will be plastic in our world. My new world, I am a gluten-free farmer, baker who vends at farmer markets. I couldn't get there without my coolers, which are plastic. But it gives me the opportunity to talk with people one-on-one -on -one about vibrancy, resonance, frequency, and love. So that's what that's where I'm at now. That's where this brought me to, and I couldn't be happier. <laughs> and I know where you are, and it's a wonderful place to be. Yeah. So now, uh, and, again, I want to have your closing things, but the one thing I would like you to add into it is if could you tell us a little bit about your book that's coming out in 2023 in the closing now? Uh, the book that's coming out next year is called Ozzy at 75. Uh, the publisher is doing this series of books about famous musicians in the year they turned 75. Oh, so wow. like they did, they did Bowie at 75 this year. Ozzy Osbourne turned 75 next year. And they asked me, would you like to do this? And I jumped at it. Because, no. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was on this really aggressive deadline that I can't believe I met. Uh, and it was a blast. I loved every second of it. And, you know, again, from, you know, working on the Woodstock book, like that really, be, that, that was the lesson is like, make sure you like what you're doing and make sure that, you know, what's going to live on after you is something that you're proud of. And I feel like Karen and I made, made a book of, you know, very high quality. We were very serious about it, very conscientious about it, wanted every, everything as perfect as possible. And, um, I don't know. I, I feel I feel like it was a good it was a good thing for me in the sense of like sort of redirecting my career a bit and also just redirecting me. Because mm -hmm. before that, I, I would just take any work that anyone handed me 
uh, in, I mean, it's, it's a competitive field and you do have to kind of play ball to some extent. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I mean, doing, doing books is the best in my opinion, that stuff, that stuff is on a shelf in our house on what I call the accomplishment shelf. It's right there. I can touch it. I like that accomplishment. Shelf. The accom yeah. The, the accomplishment shelf. shelf. Yeah, and uh, you know, because all the stuff I've written, like for the internet and for uh, CNBC, and that that all goes away. Uh, it's not it's not permanent. Uh, the nature of news is that whatever you wrote is obsolete in half an hour. Right. Mm -hmm. And this stuff, what's the most appealing to me about it is how lasting it is, and how tangible it is, and you know, and how it's the difference between listening to music on a record and listening on your little. Uh, you know, Bluetooth speaker. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. You can kind of get close to that, but it's not the same. And so th this has really made me want to pursue more analog projects, I guess, uh, that are about real people. And I decided that what I really want to do in my career is help people tell their stories. Because I think that that's, that's really what I do. And that's really who I am. And I don't think I would have really made that connection without this book. So, and I have to really thank Karen for just letting me do it the way I wanted to do it. Uh, she really didn't interfere. She really wasn't like, I, no, take out that whole section. That's, that's no good. She really just let it be what it was. Well, Karen, well it was yeah. such great ideas. It was, it was so evolutionary. It was wonderful. Yeah. Um, An amazing oh, and, and, lady. And we met you. <laughs> the absolute last thing I want to say, and then I'll shut up, I promise. <laughs> but there's that whole segment in my book about the brown acid and how there was no brown acid and brown acid is a lie. When we were doing the book signing event at Bethel Woods, the guy sitting next to me, who was also an author who had been at Woodstock, took the brown acid. So we just, we, that was quite a discussion. Uh, so yes, it was there. Uh, it was cut with speed, seems to be the, the consensus. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was just the beginning of like, you know, shitty biker speed being in all the <laughs> LSD and that's why it's not fun anymore. <laughs> there, I'm done. You can talk. <laughs> so I want to share the most, to me, the number one most thing that I got from being able to participate with you guys and that you honored me when you allowed me to be there with your book signing at Bethel. That was one of the highest moments of my whole 2019. Uh, but what you did for me that you didn't realize, and I want to share a little bit about it, and then we'll close, is that because I was coming to be with you at Bethel, and I'd left California, my whole goal was only to be there for the book release party, but that I had to go see my friend Sharon in 2019 because A, she lives in the town of Woodstock. B, it was the money I made babysitting for her children that I used to buy my tickets for Woodstock. And C, on my 12th birthday, she had given me this peace symbol necklace, which is in your book. Yeah. And which also uh, I just take out of a special glass case and wear on occasion. There's very few things I have from my childhood or from being a teenager. So I really cherish this so from who gave it to me and from what it means. And the teardrop was like, this was your classic peace symbol. The New York Times wanted pictures of it. I, like it got, became very popular and everybody wanted this peace symbol in their thing. Well, I went to see my friend Sharon who had given this to me when I babysat for her before heading up to uh, Karen's house. And if you did not have that at that time and I did not schedule that, I would have never gotten to see my friend for the last time in her life. And this was someone who was important to me for more than 50 years. And we sat together and I was able to open up your book and show her, here's the peace symbol you gave me. Here's the book that it's in Sharon. And I wanna thank you for everything you've done for me in my life. And that not, would have not happened had I not been invited to this event. And I'm gonna close with, what she sent spiritually through her daughter and her daughter did something that has been studied scientifically called automatic writing. Hmm. And automatic writing is something where a spirit is connecting into the 
person who has the ability to take their pen and pencil and write with the spirit of a deceased person does not. And her daughter, who is a mother of a single mother raising a child, this is nothing she could have ever written. So we know how this came from Sharon. Yeah. Sharon was an artist and she used to do things like Monet. This is Monet oh, wow. Water Lilies. And I'm just gonna read you this as we end our show because I think it's a beautiful thing to share. A life is fragile, beautiful and perfect, alone together in a pond of water lilies. A masterpiece, the finest work of art, each life painted on a canvas of love. It's a short-lived gift. Explore all your colors, for like Monet's bridge, we will cross to the other side. My paint has been set, preserved in your memories, our time together so special. Please remember it all. Look for the water lilies. That is where I will be, peaceful afloat, eternally yours. And she's buried in the Woodstock Cemetery in the town that she lived in, that she used to go to all the years as a young girl doing art. And because of COVID, I didn't get to be there with her family. And I feel that it's a wonderful thing for me able to share on this show for whoever's listening, the love and the beauty of this woman and what she had to share and who Not she meant to me. <laughs> so I wanna thank you listeners for being here today. I wanna to thank Karen and I wanna thank Dan. I, I, this is a new format where I'm having two guests at a time, second show in a row. You're coming on after our uh, Tommy Chong and David Blank. And I know I'm an emotional tearing person, but you know that we have lots of laughter on the show. And we also have tears because we're sharing our heart and we're making sure that people share their stories that heal. Have a wonderful day and thanks for being here. Bye. Peace and love out. <laughs>